the march of time. Until the time comes to strike at Hitler's subjugated Europe, most critical area of the Allied military effort remains North Africa, its approaches and frontiers. Directly menacing the Allied sea, rail, and air routes to the battlefronts of today and tomorrow is Spanish Morocco, where thousands of veteran Spanish troops await whatever orders may come from their chieftain in Madrid, El Caudillo, Dictator Francisco Franco, no friend of democracy. The fascist regime of the new Spain today has taken on all the militant mumbo jumbo of a totalitarian autocracy, with enshrined heroes like its Jose Antonio Primo de Rivera, founder of the Falange, today the only political party tolerated in Spain. Born in the bloodiest civil war of modern times, the new Spain has sought, in religion and ceremony, to link itself to the old Spain of centuries past, and to give to its grandiose plans for the future the authority of clerical traditionalism. In every city, posters proclaim Spain's ideological battle against democracy, call for recruits to fight with Franco's blue divisions, against the liberalism he terms decadent. Most dynamic cultural body in Madrid is the Council of Hispanidad, fountainhead of phalangist ideology and the chief source of anti-democratic propaganda in Latin America, where the ideals of Franco Spain are today in direct conflict with the American good neighbor policy for the Western Hemisphere. But in Washington, the men who shape America's foreign policy are by no means anxious to add another enemy to the list of nations America must fight in 1943. To wean Spain from dependence on the Axis, America has facilitated shipments of oil, food, and fertilizer, has bought from Spain cork, minerals, and wine, which might otherwise have found an Axis market. But opposing any policy of courting the favor of fascist Spain are men whose knowledge of Spain, past and present, is first-hand, able U.S. news correspondents. John Whitaker knew Spain when it was still Western Europe's most decorative, if backward, monarchy. Founded by the Christian kings who drove out the Moorish caliphs, Spain's five centuries of unbroken national existence had always been marked by war and by extremes of poverty and wealth, misery and grandeur. In 1931, Alfonso XIII, last monarch of Spain's reigning house of Bourbon Habsburg, went into exile after a bloodless revolution which upset the Spanish throne and established a republic of moderates. But already aligned against the new republic were all the forces of Spanish reaction. Says reporter Whitaker, who knew well the men of the old regime, Count Romanone spoke frankly. The rebellion, we planned it the day we lost the election. The reactionaries decided to get in touch with the German and Italian governments and to create incidents and spread terrorism. There was a military rising in Morocco. It became nationwide on July 18, 1936. In Spain generally, and in the cities especially, 
the Spanish people were mobilizing in vast numbers to crush the rebel bands. It was the invasion of Spain by the Moors, ferried across the straits from Africa by Italian planes, which saved the rebel traders from the firing squad. Aid for the Republicans was sent by Communist Russia and by France but not in sufficient quantities to match the supplies and men poured in by Hitler and Mussolini. Reports Whitaker. Volunteers of the International Brigade streamed into Madrid. Anti-fascist Germans and Italians backed by tough Frenchmen. They believed that the conscience of the democracies of the world had been stirred. They believed that to die now was not to die in vain. But for most of the democratic world, the issues in Spain were confused by the extremists on both sides. The United States and Great Britain adopted a hands-off policy. And in due course, reporter Whitaker saw the collapse of Republican resistance. To Spain at the war's end went another American correspondent, calm, objective Thomas Hamilton, to report the country's condition under Franco's new order. Wrote correspondent Hamilton, The incorrigible inefficiency of the Franco regime has delayed recovery. But Franco's government today points with pride to its return to normal living and its work of post-war reconstruction. In Madrid, it is gradually repairing the public buildings its army helped destroy. Throughout Spain are being erected new edifices to house its growing legions of civil servants. Banking and finance in Spain have passed under the complete control of the Falangist Party and its newly appointed functionaries. Faithful supporters of the regime, they are today the masters of what is left of Spain's gold reserves. Hamilton reports, Because of reduced economic activity, Franco's heavier taxes have produced considerably less than four billion pesetas a year. And meanwhile, he has been spending about seven billion, expenditures on the armed forces accounting for much of the increase. The major problem of Spain is food. In a land of 26 million people, where a piece of bread is far more real than money, workers must accept fascism as a condition of their employment and nutrition. The task of caring for Spain's war orphans and its dispossessed is an enormous one. In the Spain of today, the administration of government relief has devolved upon the philangist Auxilio Social, an organization modeled after Hitler's Winterhilfe and governed by a national council of party members, sociologists and clergy. <laughs> Funds for the Auxilio Social are collected on a semi-voluntary basis to be expended in strict accordance with philangist principles. The Auxilio Social has not withheld its relief from the widows and orphans of the former Republicans and has made a real attempt to alleviate the suffering and misery of the poorer classes of the urban population. But its humane endeavors have been marred by boondoggling and waste, says correspondent Hamilton. The Auxilio Social widened the gulf between the haves and the have-nots. The flowers for the children's dining rooms were bought in season and out but the parents were not so fortunate. The majority collected their daily ration of thin soup and a little bread. They were supposed to take it home to eat, but most were too hungry to wait. The hungry Spain Thomas Hamilton reported was once a large producer of food. Even today, whole regions still have an exportable surplus of grain, of citrus fruits or of seafood.
Yet so crippled by war and inefficiency are the means of transportation that these supplies can rarely be moved in time to the regions where they are needed most. Today in Spain, over half a million Republican prisoners are still in the hands of their fascist jailers. Head of the prison system is Phalangist General Maximo Cuervo, by whose authorization these films were taken in the model prisons of Madrid, Alcala de Naris, Valencia, and other cities of Spain. The crimes of Franco's prisoners are, by today's democratic standards, no crimes at all. Franco and the Phalangists ordered the execution of over a million Republican prisoners during the Spanish War. Today, those remaining in Phalangist prisons were the least active of those who took part in labor or radical movements, who opposed the rise of Franco's fascist to power. And in sparing the lives of even these among their former adversaries, Franco's regime feels it has been lenient and, in fact, kind. But only complete submission and repentance on the part of their prisoners can satisfy the new rulers of the new Spain. Intellectuals, and notably journalists, make their amends to the regime by editing the prison newspaper, Redemption, whose circulation is the greatest of any publication of its type in the world. The news it prints is carefully censored strictly limited to what will promote the prisoners' reformation along fascist lines. Musicians of Republican Spain's symphony orchestras today may be found playing in prison bands. Prison gymnastics are the chief form of physical recreation. The phalange symbol is the sign of coordinated precision. The fascist salute is mandatory. Prisoners whose conduct has been satisfactory may be transferred to work on the reconstruction of roads and buildings destroyed during the Civil War by fascist shells and German aerial bombs. Others worked the fields, which the war laid waste, under the watchful eye of a phalangist guard. Still other gangs of prisoners excavate by crude means a new system of irrigation canals. In the mines of Almaden and Rio Tinto, Republican veterans, whose health is sound enough to stand the arduous toil, bring up the ores and mercury, which are for Franco Spain a rich source of foreign exchange. In Franco's political prisons are not only men, but also women. Their crimes were, for the most part, those of sympathizing with their Republican husbands, sons, and fathers. They, too, must now achieve what Franco deems reform. Their children, often born in prison, are technically free. For them, the fascist state has other plans. For they are the new generation on which Franco means to build his nation and his empire. They are to be educated into the regimented life which fascist Spain has set as its ideal. From the time they enter the Ogar, Franco's children must dedicate their every hour to the aims of the fascist state.
They will live for the state and for the day when they can take part in Franco's dreams of military grandeur and conquest by the force of arms. They learn phalangist geography, in which particular emphasis is laid on Spain's lost empire of Latin America and Africa, to be reconquered when Franco has achieved his internal and European aims. Their civil education is largely based upon handicrafts, for fascist Spain looks with suspicion on many ideas which come from books, needs strong hands for the work it has to do. When Franco's children march on parade, they are already well on their way to the goal their dictator has set for them. New conquistadors, pledged to restore to Spain its ancient glories. Thus, the report of March of Time's cameras on the Spain of 1943. But the regimented legions of fascist dictators, in whatever country they may be found, today are watched with grave concern by men of democratic faith. For the nations of the democratic world are fighting for the destruction of tyranny, not for its preservation. Time marches on.